So in the first panel uh, concerning Syrian NGOs challenges and sustainability, we have Dr. Hani El Bala, which is a doctor and co-founder of Islamic Relief. He is also currently the president of the Humanitarian Forum, an international network of NGOs providing a platform for dialogue advocating for a legal framework for greater transparency and accountability. We have also Smriti Patel. Uh, she has been working in and on humanitarian action since 1997 in diverse locations, ranging from Thailand, Chechnya, Afghanistan, India, and Myanmar. She worked with local and national partners of NGOs to promote greater accountability of relief agencies. She conducted in-depth consultation with Syrian organizations and is also the founder of the Global Mentoring Initiative, uh, which focuses on creating, creating mentoring platforms to accompany local NGOs. We also have Nabid Sadozai, who is a public health specialist with an extensive experience. Uh, after working for 10 years at the UNICEF in the areas of child protection and child health, he has since been working at the World Health Organization in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. In 2013, in northern Syria, he coordinated the implementation of polio campaign and he recently became a member of the Transition and Strategy Unit. He is here on his personal capacity. And uh, finally, I would like to introduce you our moder moderator, Dr. Zadun al -Zwabi. Uh, who is a pacifist activist from Syria and the CEO of Yusom. He is engaged with civil society issues in Syria and beyond, and he invests in networking and is engaged with UN Office of Special Envoy, uh, which is facilitating women advisory board and civil society support room. I uh, will now pass the word to Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, dear students, first of all, I'm honored to be in Geneva, in this university, and among such a great group of panelists with their great expertise. Uh, before we proceed to our panel, a small announcement while we are here meeting right now, the hospital of Kavernibel was targeted with five air raids, and it is fully destroyed now. So when everyone lives here in peace. Let's think of the great doctors and physicians inside the country, um, paramedic, the paramedics, who really sacrifice their souls to rescue Syrian people. And I ask you all to applaud them all. Uh, I would like first to ask uh, uh, my dear friend, Madrid, to start with this uh, remarks. Probably of eight to 10 minutes. Madame, Monsieur, bonjour. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning. I think I can go on with many languages. But what brings us together is humanity. Our languages become our strength. Our differences become our strength. And that is what brings us together hopefully today and hopefully to help people in need, especially people in Syria. Uh, I've had almost 29 years of experience with UN working in some very difficult situations. But uh, my most typical and challenging assignment was when I was trying to implement polio eradication and our polio rounds in Northern Syria. And this was 2013. And I have I met some fantastic people, extremely courageous, uh, things that one would not even expect. I've had fantastic partnerships with people from all, all over the world. People who would like to help, really would try to go beyond the call of duty to try to make sure that the life for the children in their capacity, whatever they could do, would improve. I think this is our great aim. We need to start thinking as one race, and that is human race. I don't know of any other race. And I think this is important that for a change we start only talking of one race, and come together as one to help people in real need. I 
have had difficult experiences in Afghanistan. I was there for six and a half years. Most people were there too. So some of us have had those experiences in South Sudan during the war period, 1999. I've never been as shocked to see atrocities and difficulties and challenges that I experienced with people in northern Syria. And I think in this day and age, none of us can really absolve themselves from this responsibility. It's my responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility, and I think we need to come together and try to see what we can do to try to allay their difficulties. It's not going to be easy, it's challenging, but I think there's no comparison, not even, we can't even think of the difficulties that people in northern Syria face. This is death. Probably the ones who die, their life becomes a little less good because they're not they're going to suffer anymore. But the ones who are left behind are going to continue suffering. It's a very difficult situation. I've seen it firsthand, and uh, it's unbelievable to really uh, explain. Uh, we have medical students here who are dedicating themselves towards a life of helping others in their careers. This is a fantastic profession, but I think now the lines have been drawn a little different. Medical professionals are right on the front lines. And I think that those are the kind of challenges that we have to discuss. Those are the kind of challenges we need to negotiate. And those are the kind of challenges we need to come up, come to terms with. And then bring together everyone to see how we can help our political systems, our politicians, our humanitarians, our civil societies, which I think is the most important element that we at times tend to forget. You need everyone, but people who are inside, they need to be some or the other made part of this entire support system. It is not charity, number one, it's my duty. So let's forget about that, that I mean. Whatever I do is very less. So we need to bring them together. But at the same time, it's very important to see what the end users think of our plans. What is their need? How can they become part of it? And once we get that engagement in a partnership manner, trust me, it's different. And I'm talking from experience, where polio eradication would not have been possible in a country with that kind of war situation, with more than a thousand war infections. You can't even name them. Bringing and taking vaccines inside, which was almost impossible. Taking it to every village, every household, which is a program which is universal, it has never been done there before, with people who have never had experience in doing this. So we have stopped immunization, the eradication polio immunization or polio eradication was more or less achieved there about 10 years in 1993 for the last case that they had. So imagine a new generation which had never done this kind of a thing and they never went to house to house in any way. The system was strong so they, they stopped the transmission without going house to house. Establishing house to house system, the only way we could do it was to bring in the civil society. And that was my challenge to all the NGOs. USM was luckily one of our great partners in the polio task force. That anybody who can bring the, youth, the local councils out for me, we will only work and support them. We had 200 of local councils from everywhere brought out, trained, and the heroics that happened and they did it with just two days training is unbelievable. They were innovative, they were courageous, they were all in it. And polio was interrupted. I wish other countries, including my country, Pakistan, would learn from it. They have done a super job. So I'll stop here. I think it will be very important for us to interact and hear from everyone else. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to contribute here. Um, just to say that I have had contact with Osama since uh, 2013, and Dr. Chama was the, the, the contact here. I've been working on uh, looking at capacities of local and national organizations, and actually uh, capacities of organizations and how they're going to maintain um, uh, the continuous support. Um, and 
just listening to to you uh, your first introductions, you know, um, there are for me there are five types of capacities that are really really key, um, and I think I'd like to go through them quickly because it's really important to understand. Um, we seem to focus only on delivering on results, for example, which is very, very important. Uh, but what really brought out for me just now is, is the ability and the capacity to commit and act. Your motivation, as those five doctors who started this organization, and now how it's grown is absolutely key uh, to sustainability. So going forward, how will you make sure that this motivation, this energy, confidence to carry on this work that you're doing and that you maintain the quality? And that takes leadership. So uh, leadership development in your organization, in any organization is absolutely key going forward. So these are some of the challenges perhaps of the future because as the generations change, how do you make sure you maintain that is, is really, really important. And you know, uh, this collective purpose that you first had, how do you make sure that the younger generation continue that? And I think that's one of the key challenges going forward. Um, the second um, thing that I want to say is capacity to really create results, making sure that you are not only talking about outputs, right? Because this is what we focus on. But here, we really want to focus on relevance. How can you continue to be relevant and also ensure that you provide quality support? Really, really key. Um, and that's what will stand you out, right? So any organization who wants to continue and actually be sustainable needs to make sure and make sure that you're improving your capacities over time. Uh, the third thing I think is really absolutely key is um, capacity to relate and attract. And by this I mean making sure that you continuously attract financial resources and possibility from a variety of sources. And I know this is a really difficult thing. Uh, when I was interviewing the, the um, NGOs in, in Syria, um, what I found was that, um, that commitment, the motivation that first started and everybody was, um, you know, raising funds and being able to do it. But now, it's six years on. How can you continue that energy, right? There are only finite resources, so you have to really now focus more systematically on fundraising, communications, those types of things. Perhaps that wasn't so key before, but now it's a, it's a different scenario. In the, um, because of the difficulties out there and a difficult environment, how can you make sure you maintain that? Making sure you have motivated skills in terms of staff. Um, so one thing that comes out very clearly in, in your, the discussion with Osam as well is that um, it's a medical organization, but actually the other skills to maintain an organization are actually really, really important. Fundraising, communications, and sometimes we don't pay as much attention to that as, as the actual outputs we have in terms of medical terms. So just to get that balance to make sure you can sustain yourself is really important. Making sure that um, you, know, you gain and maintain credibility I talked to Dr. Chama, uh, um, I think it was a couple of months ago, about um, maintaining the, the standards, because that's what also gives you legitimacy. How can you maintain that? Uh, when you've expanded from a, a small organization to now 1,500 staff, how will you maintain that across the organization? It's, it's really a challenge for the organization. And making sure that you are connected still to your populations. Uh, because that can become a problem if you start, uh, the security is very tough and you start uh, doing maybe uh, some remote um, kind of programming. So those things are really uh, key. Um, so the third one, make sure that you can actually have the capacity to renew and adapt. Because in the situation you're in, and the changing situation over time, because of the tough um, environment right now, how do you make sure you're learning from your experiences, 
not only um, between yourself, but if you now have 1,500 staff and you're in different regions, how do you connect with each other and see what you're learning? And, and that you are providing that knowledge across the organization. So you need to have something in place to make sure you capture that. Really, really important. Especially in, in the light of the deteriorating situation. Um, and lastly, um, really maintaining the coherence. Again, if you have expanded in such a big way, how do you make sure that your staff in the different region really understand and you, you are really um, implementing in a coherent way? Because otherwise you can lose your focus and it can be fragmented. Um, making sure that um, various aspects of, of your organizations are marching along similar lines uh, between your mission and strategy making sure that the strategy and the resources are connected as well. Um, so I'm coming at this from a, a, an organizational development angle, making sure that these five aspects are there, because sometimes we only get focused on compliance to the international donors, right? Uh, but we don't focus on the beneficiaries, and, and staff and how you maintain that movement. Because yours is a movement, right? And I think most senior organizations, it's coming from the heart. Um, how do you keep that heart going uh, in, in the difficult uh, environment is, is absolutely key. Making sure you've got this really a good balance and an effective decision-making capacity in your, um, in your management structure, but that you have your staff with you at different levels, because they all contribute. So um, that would be my questions to you. Uh, these five aspects, how are you going to look at that in your organizations to make sure that it is, it maintains its capacity and also that it's sustainable? I've had many discussions with uh, Dr. Chama on this, and I think this is a challenge for all serial organizations. I have seen them from very small, uh, organizations in Syria when I was there in 2014, when I see them now, they have grown immensely, and that's great, but how do you maintain it and be uh, able to be you know, really stable is, is the biggest question. Thank you very much. I invite Dr. Banna, the great group for many Syrian organizations. celebration, motivation, and the drive to take it from today till the next generation. I came from Antakya and Rehaneya uh, last week, not last week, this week. When is it? Yeah, when is it? Yeah. I was very motivated by the Syrian refugees in Turkey who managed to establish more than 4,000 CSOs in Turkey. In certain Arab countries, the number of CSOs are less than 1,000, where they have stability, security, and safe life. So we have to salute the Syrian. Number, number two, the birth of awesome is better than the birth of the Islamic League. You have 1,500 workers after six years. When I was in Islamic League 33 years ago, no desks, no telephone, no fax. There was no internet at that time, no computer, all manual, but the big writing pads, sheets, and all these sorts of things. Legging, no internet. We used to walk, take the bus, everything. Uh, now maybe 6,000 workers, but you did it in a faster way because you have the heart, the drive, and the ability as doctors. And I encourage you to register in the country that supports 
politically and uh, humanitarianly the mission of Osam, which is UK. Don't leave UK out of you. Politically, you need strong countries to help you as well. So don't leave it out. You be in Geneva, the city of humanitarian, global humanity, global humanity, global humanitarian activity. But the city of politics is gone. Not for even Washington. Ah, so you are British, huh? <laughs> this, this is before Brexit. Huh? Whether Brexit comes or not, it's just uh, Let me talk about what I was going to talk about it today. For me, sustainability is not only a fundraising event. It's a long-term process huh? made up of several building blocks. Okay, I can have millions. But my operation is not sustainable. That's why you have five points in your discussion. I have five points on my discussion. I was in my eye clinic, not mine. I, I used to be a medical doctor, too, like you, but I gave it up. I was visiting the eye clinic yesterday, and this was my talk. Not this one, it's another talk. And uh, which I wrote, waiting for my, for my doctor. Five parts. Had nothing to do with the fundraising. Externally, we have to do networking, connectivity. Don't ever drop it. Cooperation, be cooperative to others. Externally, go into coalition. You want to be protected when you are small. Start to learn. The issue of advocacy. What do we mean by advocacy? In the Quran, Allah said, Wala yahubbu. The word hub is advocacy. Okay? Start build strong partnership with others. And this others is every other. Not others of our groups, theological backgrounds, okay, religious backgrounds, others. Open it up. Don't color yourself with an ideology. Because sometimes the ideology could be divisive more than united. And definitely, externally, you have to build a good government relationship. Learn to build good government relations. This actually has awesome moving to in the 21st century to the 22nd century, inshallah. This is the external relation part of it. Sustainability for me also is the idea. What's my role? Awesome. What's the role of awesome? What awesome wants to do? It has to define its role. Not only a role, but a leading role. You don't be like anybody else. You have to identify your role and let people or others to follow you because you are a leader. In your role. Research has to be a part and parcel of whatever anything. Now we talk about counter terrorism. We talk about the risking and the difficulty of transferring funds. Where is the evidence based research paper? No. We give hot speeches. Hot speech is not good enough for government. Research values. What's our values? Stand for humanity, as everybody said. To protect humanity, to save humanity, especially in Geneva. Geneva is the city of humanity. Okay? So if you want to talk about humanity, come to Geneva. If you want to talk about protection, go to London. <laughs> so you need the humanity and the, and the protection as well. Values, research. An institutional memory. Stories. Children, women, great people, great initiatives. Keep writing. Keep writing the history. Because one day, people will look at the history, find awesome there. Without having the institutional memory built inside the organization from the very beginning, 
You have no history. You cannot exist. Nobody will talk about you. No good time story. No fairy story about you. No dreams about you. No songs. No drama. No theater. Okay? So you make it. The second point about what we are. Huh. Internally, transparency is the key issue. Some of the humanitarian principles. Transparency. The money we have is not ours. It's theirs. We belong to them. We work for them. They are our masters. The children who are frozen children die of being frozen. In Lebanon or Turkey, they pay my salary. They pay my car renter. So I have to work for them as an employee. And this is where we start thinking our philosophy of, of thinking about what we are here for. Talk about humanity. Humanity means I work for the people who pay my salary, which are the refugees, the displaced, the orphans, the widows, the sick, the elderly. Those are my masters. Not Hani Banna as a chairman or Dr. Tayyar as a chairman. No. It is this little miserable looking child with running nose, pale foot, and sick, crying, sticky eyes. He is the one who is helping me to survive. Governance, attendance. Governance, no nepotism. Ever. Never. Political decision has to be made inside the organization, not outside the organization. The board has to decide this sustainability. Because people listen to us. Why are in our bedroom whispering? Through the what do you call it? Google Earth or Google whatever you call it. Okay, sometimes they have to leave the telephone outside the bathroom. <laughs> clarity of the message. Clarity of the mission. Have to be very clear and focused. Are we medical? We are medical. Are we humanitarian? We are humanitarian. We are not political. We are not connected to political groups. Clarity. Of course, neutrality and impartiality sometimes is difficult, but it has to be done. And this also a part of our principle of thinking in the Quran. They feed out of love the prisoners of war. Out of love, not out of job description. You got it? Not out of job description. Out of love. Love means belief. Belief means submission to God and the humanity. So this is the third part, which is the internal, the inner soul. The fourth part, our program. Two things. My daughter, my, my daughter. <laughs> Still very young. <laughs> My sister talked about uh, uh, capacity building or building. Program is to do two things: building local community and empowering local community. If awesome does not build local community and empower them, it's failing and not sustain itself. We talk about localism, localism inside Syria, localism inside the displacement area, localized with the refugees. This is the program. Number five, which is the last, because I need to finish now. What's next? When we said that we have 4,000, maybe 400, 5,000, or 400 organizations in Turkey only, we need to move out from the single organization to building blocks, really, building unions, building forums, building platforms, building networks, building consortium. This building consortium and, and, and syndicates let us to be able to build the infrastructure or to try the trial of building an infrastructure for my country, Syria. Single organization can do good work. But working together collectively is where we can 
build the infrastructure as a target inside Syria and somewhere else. Fora, unions, platforms, network, consortium, syndicates, think tanks, and research institutions definitely becomes a necessity of sustainability. Okay? And the last, oh, that's this about the last. So now I came to thank you very much for inviting me to be with you. I'm a Geneva man, but from London side. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the panelists for these inspiring words. Uh, just to remind myself, I remind everyone with um, uh, major points. Uh, Mr. Nabit spoke about partnerships with CSOs and the uh, important role they play on the ground, not only civil society, but also he mentioned local councils, which in fact play a major role right now in Syria. Uh, Smuti, my dear friend, uh, spoke about uh, the growth of NGOs, the need for leadership, uh, the gen next generation of learning from us uh, so that the organization is sustainable. It requires financial resources. Uh, sustainability means financial resources, but also means skills, knowledge management, knowledge capturing, and it's not, not that only soft skills, but uh, hard skills, but also soft skills administration, coherence versus fragmentation of the organization, and vision and strategy. Uh, Dr. Banda, I think I don't need to remind you all. <laughs> uh, sustainability is a process uh, with major building blocks. It's not about only uh, fundraising, but it's about networking, connectivity, Building good government relationships, please advise us on how we do that. <laughs> Research and not only hot speeches, institutional memory, the importance of transparency and commitment inside the organization. We work for the beneficiaries, we get our finances from them, in fact. Good governance and clarity of the mission. Uh, research and uh, commitment to empowering community and localism, moving from single organization to coalitions, syndicates, forums, etc. I hope I covered all these points and I leave it now to, to you for more questions. I just need to mention that in the folder you have, if you just leave us the documents with your remarks, then we can just write a more rich report. Uh, I take the first uh, the Yeah, Thanks very much. Thanks very much for your uh, presentation. I'll start from where you ended, uh, about the having a syndicate or a forum or a union. That was the main principle, what we call the union of medical care, because we know that the uh, need is a massive, not a single organization can fulfill impossible, and the coordination among the different organizations forming the union is a paramount, is essential. And I just wanted to explain that we are really realizing how important is that. And we're trying to expand the union by calling more organizations to work under the umbrella of union, keeping at the same time the independence of each individual organization. This was our principle right from the beginning. We did have a bit of struggle with other people, you know, but eventually we managed to stream on and I think that's our contribution for the future. Thank you. Questions, remarks, comments? I'd like to uh, mention the implementation, community implementation, uh, Dr. Zulana. Well, I think this, uh, I'll be back to this, to the specificity I mentioned for also. We are really becoming, in each country, 
an implementation for this country to hear the message of Awesome for the future. Actually, I do know that Awesome Holland have members from Poland in their committee. Awesome Switzerland have members from Switzerland. They are not Syrian. They are even not doctors. And we do implement our message through civil society in each country to make it clear that the future will be handled through this Syrian historical crisis. This is implementation. Thank you, Dr. Bell. More questions? OK, let me ask uh, Navi myself. Dr. Uh, OK, sorry. Again, thank you very much for our panelists and uh, to be part of our you know, uh, conference here to participate in the crisis in Syria. And as Dr. Fayyar said, we are all Syrian physicians who came from Syria. We live in different parts of your world, our in Texas, and we have people from Syrian physicians sitting in each country. And really our idea for the union to bring all this expertise in one area to sit together and be able to think and deliver and reach to this Syrian, as you said, Dr. Hani, to that child, to that sick person, and to deliver the quality medicine and reach the best quality uh, health and health. And I think my comment is just I'd like to, because I heard different you know, points, which one of you brought to the expertise, which is really that would be rich our, you know, ourselves as a human, I think, I like you. And I know there's a process right now to, to go through the panel and ask our question to give us really, after you think together at the end of this panel, to give us some key point which you agree all of it to be our initial as we move in here to Geneva and starting our headquarters in Geneva. What do you think is the best thing from best of you to give us, each one of you, one or two points, advice, which we consider it because now we're going to be meeting actually tomorrow morning as a board and we're trying to get the best out of this conference to be also part of strategic uh, our movement. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting option what you were mentioning, 400 CSO, 4,000 CSO, it's amazing. I think, how the, however, the challenging thing is, how do you bring them together on picking up one or two key areas? That's where we have a problem, because what happens, and all our experiences in the field, in the humanitarian field, everybody wants to have their individuality. So what did Osamara achieve? What did WHO achieve? What did so-and-so achieve? I think this is the time that we need to pick up areas of work and come together. That would be our challenge. We have not been able to tackle that very well so far. Let's be frank about it. You have tried it many times. You have coordinated the body. Oja does it. Others do it. NGOs come up, come together. When I was working in South Sudan, we had operational lifeline for that. All UN agencies, 50 plus uh, yes, NGOs. Typically, to pick up areas. Still, every agency wants because this is how they get their money. So I think this is you cannot blame the market. It's, uh, so some of the other, how do you brief that that uh, or challenge take take up that challenge, mitigate it in a manner where the end users decide what they want. I think one interesting option now available to us is through web. Despite the difficulties in northern Syria, it's amazing how people still have access, some areas, to the internet. Bring the civil societies together. You have people from Switzerland, you have people from other areas. Civil societies, bring civil societies together and let them discuss, have a discourse as well. That is the most powerful discourse. People from within, when they get together to the civil societies, it's very difficult to ignore that. You and I talking may reach some. It does not reach the civil societies. It does not reach the communities. Community to community dialogue and discourse reaches and is much more powerful. And we have seen some of those examples. So I think that's very important. Some of the other we pick up those areas where we ensure, end of the day, your success depends on your alliance building. Let's be sure about it. That alliance building is what we are talking about. So your advocacy, right down to your communication, is primarily to bring up those alliances. How do you strengthen those alliances? How do you bring them together? How do you strengthen them? How do you go to the most important step where they agree on 
two or three doable key areas to start with and not try to do 78 things and may not be able to really do justice to any of those. How do we bring in our forces together to make a difference? I think that is important. And to make a difference, we all want to make a difference. Each organization has the same goals to make a difference. How do we bring our forces together to choose one or two areas where we can actually have the maximum impact? As you would say, US was the biggest bang for the buck. Bang is a favorite word nowadays. We also need to get rid of these kind of things. But, but I think we need more calm things now, isn't it? But I think this is critical. So let's try to do that. Usum might be because coming in fresh, coming in with fresh ideas, emerging through a need which was very naturally and taking up that fantastic uh, challenge and then running with it may, may, may lead the way. Who knows? Thank you. Um, okay, so <coughs> two things really um, come out in terms of, I, I, I know so from 2013 to now, and um, having conversations, one, uh, one thing that is really key is how will you now invest in the organizational um, processes, in terms of communication, in terms, because these are something, something that are key, knowledge management. Uh, because if you want a strong organization that looks at the evidence, how have you done, what are some of the lessons learned so that that can t be taken into the future. Uh, the, the management, your senior management who are here need to reflect going forward I know um, because the temptation is that we need all the money for the res response, which is, which is correct. But if you don't invest in some structures internally, in terms of communications, in terms of net knowledge management and other things, which this is going to be your hub, right? Uh, then I think um, there may be gaps in terms of communicating, uh, networking, how will you make sure you are networking to the Geneva uh, scene, for example? There are many times when I'm there and I say to Dr. Chama, oh, well, why, why are you not there? Because you should be there, you should be representing some of the issues. But that comes if you only if you can invest, making sure you have people who are able to do that um, and who have the skills to be able to do it. So you need to think through, uh, in terms of your human resource, what other human resources you need to invest in, other than obviously the medical doctors, because these other elements will become also key. When I look at sustainability of other organizations like MSF and all the big organizations, you will see that they have these other uh, elements in their organization that are really built up because of, not to lose the balance, <laughs> but you still have to have that investment in certain aspects of your organization. I come back to answer you uh, so practically. Uh, Syrian conflict was for me since 2011. I was running like a headless chicken between big institutions such as OIC, UN OCHA, and uh, League of Arab States. And our first workshop for Syria was in September 2011 was capacity building in Cairo, then the second one was in November, and the third one was a conference, a humanitarian conference, co-hosted by Yon Ocha as well as uh, uh, Yon Ocha and OIC. And the story goes on. After five, six years, uh, I come back to exactly what you were talking about, a new idea called uh, not information sharing, sharing the experience. We are starting to organize workshops based on experts in the organization, not consultants. And this is after going around in Turkey and other places to look at and talk to senior organizations. Uh, we discovered that delivering the technical know-how is good, but not good enough. I want the message, I want the vision, I want the spirit, I want the experience, which you people give it to them. What we want, Dr. 
to be with the people there. I just came, as I said, from Antakya, the fight. Hattai, Hattai, the fight. And, and Rehaniya. I learned a lot. But you have to be there as a senior figure. You have to be there with those organizations as a senior figure for a day or two or three or four. You are fighting one another in the discussion. Then, okay, fine. This is an opinion, it's your opinion. Take it or leave it. It's not the Quran. If you want to work with the outside world, this is the way you do it. If you live in your own world, it's entirely up to you. And I found after a hot debate between two or three groups, because we have to have open discussion. You see, alhamdulillah, the, the, the response for our workshops was tremendous. We have to take a 50% cut off of the attendees in these areas. That was in January, and the, 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 the March one was in Antakya and Hattar. Because people still think that we are in the British. say, okay, fine, revolution, good, no problem. I'm not going to talk about the revolution. I'm talking about how to work together. Let us how to work together and look at the outside world. But to be very honest, the key element for the success of such meetings is your presence. You, Dr. Tayyar, to be there. Don't send them somebody else. Okay? Me to be there. Because I'm I retired now. I'm retired. Anyway. <laughs> Not quite, it's kind of about 10 years ago. For 20 years, I've said 25 now. You're retiring yourself. <laughs> you have to be there. Be, uh, really, really, we found it. People stay Saturday, Sunday, at about 5, 6 o'clock because they want to talk. They want to cooperate. They want to connect with us. And we try this and so but we have to build it. Unfortunately, the big organizations don't invest in workshops. Invest in delivery. Okay, well, there's food, medicine, other. Okay, fine, it's good. But give me the 5 or 10 percent or the 6 percent to do this kind of connectivity. But we are succeeding. It takes some time. It will take somebody like you, or like you, or like all those senior people. Because the young organization need to see somebody with a message, not somebody only with the money. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, sure. um, I chair mental health uh, team in uh, mental uh, committee in, in here also. I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, my question is about the need on the ground that uh, there is a, a degree of discrepancy between the need and the donors. The donors that come with certain agenda, and they want to do this project. Let me give a specific example. We have some donors say interested in uh, psychosocial support for children or gender-based violence, very important subject, but not many people interested in real mental health problem, psychosis, severe mental disorders, for example. Very, very few people or, or few organizations or almost none interested in establishing something for a severe end which is mostly needed because we have collapse of mental health service or collapse of health service in general and you need to know that you are establishing something from scratch. Everything is needed, not only the soft end, the severe end. So. Coming from the ground, this is my need. While donors, they seem not very interested. Not, not, it's not very sexy to treat only schizophrenia and mental, severe mental disorder. That doesn't seem to, to sound very attractive. That applies to other sections as well, not only mental health. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that I was talking about earlier is about the, the experience and the knowledge part. And how do you build that to advocate? Because one of the things that comes out very strongly over the years of um, time I've been in, in the sector is that when you have enough evidence and you start advocating and you start then lobbying the donors, then things change. 
So how can we do that uh, for, for this type of thing? Because, um, you know, depending on the length of the conflict and what, what are some of the needs at, the, uh, at that end, unless there is a, uh, a coalition, you working with others to identify those needs and then not being the donors, it will not happen. So it's, uh, it's, it's really looking at other organizations who have the like-mindedness coming together and going to the donors together can change things. So I think that's one way of actually dealing with it. Um, I know this thing um, on localization. <laughs> We've been working on this and there's been a lot of resistance, but because we are working together with others um, and influencing the donors then and saying, actually, if you really work on these things, it's going to start meeting the needs for the future as well, because this is about the future as well. And I think that's a really important part. How do you connect that? The knowledge, the, um, the, the research, you know, then you can convert that to advocacy messages, work with others to do it, and then influence the donors. <coughs> I think this is the only way it, it, will, it will work. I think this, your point is very important, and I think that takes us to again to the same issue. It's critical if the world has to now start looking at these changing conflicts. The nature of the conflict has changed. The challenges are different, and the measures to mitigate them are available, and they're different. You can probably reach, as you said, 22 years back, you did not have a mobile phone which was which took a basic GB RAM. When I bought my first. Uh, <laughs> The desktop, when I bought my first desktop when we were very young, my daughter is here. I thought it was huge. It has got 10 MB RAM. So, so it was, I thought it was amazing. I probably invested a lot of money in doing that. But I think it's, everything has changed. So let's utilize those and let's try to rethink. And probably we are at the moment in Geneva, no place better than this to start looking at where humanitarianism really emerged from in a, in a, in a, in a manner where people were trying to be brought together. So we are in a very right place at the moment discussing this. It's critical that we get the locals engaged in the planning processes. See, the way UN works, the way humanitarians work, the way <coughs> NGOs work, it is, I know, I did it in Afghanistan, yes, but even in Afghanistan, one district, what you implement cannot be implemented similar in the same way in the next district. What I implement in village A has to be adapted a little for village B. How can you get that experience and then try to do the same in a different country? Different cultures. What, what is correct for Aleppo cannot work in Idlib. Idlib people still don't believe Aleppo has the best cuisine. I might. <laughs> so, so, so see, we, we are, we are, we are, we are we're looking at we're looking at something which is human. What is correct for Geneva is not exactly the same for Lazar. It's next door. So we need to respect those differences and work according to those strengths. I would look at those as strengths. Some of those look at the strengths in the community instead of looking at the weaknesses. Build on those strengths. That's another very critical point and critical strategies. Look at the strengths. And how do you do that? By talking to people. I shifted there for three months. For two months, you went for not provide a single drop of vaccine. Not a single penny was ever given. For the reason that there was no resolution. UN is a body which only gains its strength from the member countries. So member countries never did a resolution where they were allowed to push things from the Turkish border. Instead. So for UN, quote unquote, Syria was a sovereign country. Whatever Damascus said had to be done. So it is very difficult. In that sense, I was asked not to meet ABC. I was asked not to go to any offices. I did not. I would meet them at dinner. Nobody can stop me for whom I have dinner with. I would I set up networks to tell me who is coming out of homes, who's coming out of Latakia, who's coming out of Harata, their zoo. Aleppo. I would see them. Some of them were scared to meet in the daytime. I remember the small cafeterias near the university in Gaziantep, going there at 2, and I was not sure whether I would get a taxi on the way back. Some of the other Gaziantep had this amazing system of 
every second pose has a has a button, so you press and a taxi appears even at that odd time. And then after two, three times, then you uh, won't be stuck. But that is what you have to do. Take the map with you. Hey, this is the map which I gave me. These are five facilities. No, but sorry, this one has already been destroyed two weeks back. As you just mentioned, it just happened yesterday. This is a village which is no more there. People have shifted to places A, B, and C. And you're planning, you need to get them involved. Otherwise, if you're trying to do it from there, forget it. It's not going to happen. Be there. They are your teachers. So who taught me were the people from Syria. Not my experience. My experience may have helped in some of the technical issues. The cultural issues, the social cultural norms, the, 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 what is critical for any service delivery or any successful delivery comes from the locals. Respect the locals. That's the first thing for me. Unless you do that. Regarding <laughs> that uh, uh, donor, uh, what do you call it? Donor culture. I think we, if we agree as awesome, to deliver uh, a message three, five minutes weekly okay, by all the members of Boston. Okay, because now with the social media, uh, uh, we can do that. Three to five minutes, a message, keep delivering. To be picked up at the message to try. Because advocacy is not just a statement. Advocacy is another process to change the climate of thinking. So if we do it, you have got nine, nine, nine uh, 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 branches or nine uh, uh, members of Awesome and others. Let us design a message every week. <coughs> Three to five minutes, practical, from the volunteers' point of view, from the beneficiaries' point of view, and from the management point of view, on one direction. A leader is the one who can make the flow and get the people to follow his flow, not to follow anybody else's flow. Or her flow. Or, uh, sorry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, what do you say? Or her flow. So probably the, but I so have to follow Okay. Uh, yeah, the door. Again, thank you very much. I think I just want to bring, uh, bring up to you that really as a board in Austin, and each one of us, what you said, this is what we started from the day one in Austin. For our board members and legal founder and even our player, we are inside Syria. We were the first people in 2011 we were in Israel, we crossed the border, the river, because we were not allowed to go by the government. But for us to understand the need, we went to the doctor, and most of from Damascus to Idlib to Aleppo, we, we have sent in each actually area to identify some dark world to work and help in this medical mission, and that's how we started. And until today, this, we're talking about six years, Dr. Nassau Kassan, for example, he was in a chair of the trauma, uh, he's a surgeon from Toronto and he came from the trauma surgery. We went there to, we spent about a week, we went to every city in North Syria. From Aleppo, we were with them when they had the first day. And I'm talking about the world level. And I'm talking about, you know, therefore I just like, you know, for all of you and whoever listening that really, this is how we operated and we continue to operate, as you said, and I think this is a very important point and thank you for it and just enlighten. Maybe I should mention that uh, the only board that was on the ground waiting for evacuees going out of Aleppo was our board member Munir, although he's against awesome the UK, by the way. But <laughs> we should admit he was there on the ground. Uh, if you allow me uh, to ask, before 2011, there was no civil society in Syria. It was criminalized. The world, till now, is not allowed in Syria. Even all, um, there is something called the charity school, it is called community-based organizations, but the word civil society is considered as a crime issue. So we were born literally on 2011. And now we're talking about awesome, a budget of 20 million, uh, 1500. Um, have we grown faster than we should do? And we have to grow because the need is immense. At the same time, in a span of five years, a budget of that number, and a task force of that number, I think it's risky. Now the question to all of you, how can we strike balance between the need and the need to grow and to sustain ourselves? 
Not an easy, not an easy answer actually. I think what's important in for an organization like Usom is because I like organizations for the reason that it grew out of a need. It was no other reason for it. It was not even doing good. It was a need. Where exactly where you did, where some people who otherwise had a better life or could have had a better life dedicated themselves. So I think it's for me it is about dedication. But that dedication for me is already a success that you have continued for six years. I would doubt it too. I wanted to be a plastic surgeon and go to US, thank God I didn't do that. But but, but I mean this is this is what it's an easy life. And dedicating your life for one day is fine, ten days is ex is very good, a month is exceptional, but dedicating it for good is tremendous. See, this is your strength. Look at your strength. You've dedicated yourself. Now sit back and say where you want to go. I think this is the time to revisit and see where do you want to go from here. Otherwise, you can be taken away with the flow. With, with all this, success is fine, but where do you want to go? What do you want to choose as your main, and we were also mentioning, choose as your main role. What should be the awesome role? Is the awesome role to just provide money to some CSOs? Or is it role is to lead the effort? That's a different, completely different. If it's, it's if, it, if you want to be leaders, then advocacy. Then advocacy with what? Very important point. How do you bring in allies and some of the powerful capitalists? Critical, you don't have a choice. It has happened through history. It has always been the same. It doesn't change. Nothing changes. How do we make sure that we are well, you're well connected there? Because you're all senior physicians, some most of you. You have already got some excellent platform for being strong advocates. Now, how do you connect? How do you latch on to those real decision makers, policy makers? And they are the ones who make the difference. How do you make sure that you bring in the civil societies through social media or through, through universities? Get the universities together. Get the future uh, leaders on board sooner than later. So uh, for me, the way I look at Rosam and other you, other Syrian organizations, some of other organizations are doing a super job too, that you may have a chance to be the leaders. Bringing them together, not only the Syrian organizations, but bringing in other like-minded organizations which are very keen to provide support to Syria. So maybe a little retreat for a week, looking at some of these things, asking yourself serious questions, and then setting your direction. So I think direction setting is needed in that sense because we have grown, as you said, too fast. So you need to maybe stop some of the, not be overwhelmed by this growth spur, and at the same time realize, yes, you can, you're tall enough to reach, but then what do you do with your height? And, and I think that's important. Um, okay, so for me, um, two things uh, from that um, this chart, five things. First thing about adapting and renewing. Because um, during this time, <laughs> you have grown extensively, and, and I have seen other organizations coming apart because they grow so fast. So at some point, you have to take stock. Where are you now? Um, where do you want to be? I think the, que the question. Really looking at, are you responsive organization? Um, looking at the pressures from the outside, what are some of the shocks from the outside? and then making sure that you invest in management because that's absolutely key after a certain, um, if you grow beyond a certain point. If you don't invest in your management, and by this I don't mean just medical doctors, I mean management of the organization, um, you know, your, your financial uh, systems, all the other things that you need to actually keep going and to be still legitimate and, and credible. Uh, because if you, um, one thing I've seen in other places that I've seen in some of the civil organizations is if you grow too fast, you lose the ability for quality management, right? Because, the, you know, like left hand, what the right hand is doing, what, what, you can't keep an oversight. So you need to then introduce in your organization some kind of oversight ability to make sure you, you have a, a good view of what's happening. You 
maintain your credibility and your quality. Um, and for that, you need to invest in management. So I think reflection maybe now for your board will be, uh, and I said this earlier, what investments do you need to make in the organization at some point? Because otherwise, you know, you, you could come on unstuck. Uh, just to get some of my uh, our our experience, uh, how did we protect the Islamic Cliff in September 11? Because we opened the door to the Islamic Cliff 10 years before September 11. Open the door means that we were not restricting the employment to certain group of people. Is number one. Certain theological backgrounds. Number one. Number two, attending many meetings to understand the language, the philosophy of the spoken language, not the English language. The philosophy and the terminology of the language is very important. Connecting with everybody, for, for myself, connection is protection. You can Facebook it, huh? Yeah. Tweet it. <laughs> 2000 for me. Huh? <laughs> uh, why? Because I used to become like uh, the sniffing, the sniffing DOG. When I go to this high level meeting, I know that you are from security, you are from the humanitarian, you are from the development, you are from the government. Because I get used to sit down with those people. Okay? So this is very important to go and throw your message to those people before they start writing a message about you. It's very important. Okay? To do this, to open. Open door policy. In humanitarian work, we have nothing to hide. If you have the policy of nothing to hide, okay, you grow steadily, progressively. Because people will say, okay, fine. I have this. You can come to this conference. You can come to this workshop. I have this money. You can do this, 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 this. With actually the personal relationship. It's decision making, as, as uh, brother was talking about, was based on this kind of personal relationship. On a cup of tea, on a cocktail at night. I was well, once upon a time I was in, the, in Davos, and there was a meeting after midnight, a cocktail champagne meeting, and my beach was gone. And they said, somebody looked at me. And said, what are you doing here? I said, there's a meeting. I said, but you are drinking, and you look like a Muslim. You don't drink. Why you come here? And I left the meeting. Okay. This kind of business being made on lunch, dinner, cup of tea, cup of coffee, and, and, and it's not actually by emailing things. And protection also is coming from there. So really, something I, I also need to say, separate the line between management and the board. And don't let the board to put their nose in every action. You have a dead meat. Very dead meat and rotten meat. I was... No, 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 no. I, 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 no, 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 no. One of the... One, one, one of the... Uh, I have to interrupt you here. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm speaking to those people here. Those people? I'm teaching the engines, huh? We have the, the, the Geneva engines. Uh, the good thing, the relationship between me and the board when we started, because I was founder, they gave me the freedom and they kept the distance. That's why it's not, it grew in a very difficult time from no budget, no vision, nothing to what you can see nowadays. And the, there was a positive space between the executive and the board. Once you empower the board, as you rightly said, review actually their activity every three months, every two months, or quarterly, whatever it is. Empower them, really. And the board has to choose the best of employees. You see, in UK, nowadays, even one of our sister organizations, they are choosing the trustees by uh, advertising. Okay? You know, what happened to the Muslim organization is normal now. You want a trustee? was specializing in finance or public relationship or governance or uh, media, put an advertisement and get the application form exactly about the job description for the board member. We do not do it. I, I, I'm talking about myself. I do not do it because I hear the wrong word. So this kind of things which let you, let me, to stand on the same level of the other organization in America, 
because you are in the, in the far west and UK is in the midwest with Europe. So really we need to understand the mechanics of the surrounding and the philosophy of their thinking to enable us to have a sustainable organization and have to build all these bridges between us. I don't like to, 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 to say them, between the big us. I am a small us and you are a small us and the small us and become the big us. Okay? This is my English philosophy, I speak. Okay, um, thanks for this lively, friendly, rich discussion. Uh, thanks for the great panelists and for all the audience tonight. I think I need to just uh, conclude the, uh, the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.